So I like this quote. You can't go back and you can't stand still. If the thunder don't get you, the lightning will. And that is antivirals, right? Because they often have side effects, but if you don't take them, you're going to get sick from the virus infection. So last time we talked about vaccines, which we can use to make you immune to virus infection. So you take a vaccine before you get infected, with one exception, does anyone remember what that is? Rabies. So rabies, you can actually be immunized after you've been bitten because it has a long incubation period. But for most other, all other infections that I know of, once you acquire an infection, a vaccine cannot be used, it's not useful. So then we turn to antiviral drugs. And these can stop infections once they've started. Of course, as you will see, they're difficult for acute infections because they're so fast that you don't have a lot of time because you need to have your antiviral a certain number of hours after infection has begun. We've been working on antivirals for over 50 years, but we really don't have that many. We have about 100 or so, and that this goes up every year that I teach this course. In the beginning, that number was about 30 which was about six years ago. So there are not a lot of antivirals compared to antibiotics. If you go and look at the FDA site and look at all the antibiotics we have, hundreds and hundreds of them, only about 100 antivirals. Most of them are against these three viruses, HIV, hepatitis C virus, and all the different herpes viruses, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, etc. Why is this? Why don't we have more antivirals. Well, these are the ones we do, examples of the ones we do have. They target different stages in the viral replication cycle. Uh, we have one attachment inhibitor. Of all the viral antivirals we have, only one targets attachment of HIV. We'll talk a bit about that. We have uncoding inhibitors for influenza A viruses, and that's the only uncoding inhibitor. Actually, there's a second one for HIV. Uh, and then we have a, a variety of inhibitors that target enzymes, the polymerases, DNA and reverse transcriptase. Uh, we have inhibitors of viral proteases that are need to process viral proteins. And then we have an inhibitor of the neuraminidase, which is on the surface of influenza virus. We'll talk about how these work today. But why are there so few antivirals? One of the reasons has to do with the fact that we stated a long time ago that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to use a lot of the host machinery in order to replicate. And any time you inhibit something, you're, you're likely to impinge on the cell and therefore you're going to get side effects. So you have to find functions that are specific for the virus and that limits you. Whereas with bacteria, anything that you target is unique to the bacterium pretty much. So viruses, you have a few things you can target like proteases and polymerases. But even with the polymerases, the viral polymerases are related to uh, host cell polymerases, so you get side effects. So when there are side effects in the development of a drug, it's thrown away because you can't really use it. Many viruses are difficult to make antivirals against. Um, they're hard to grow in culture. So hepatitis B virus is still very hard to grow. Human papillomaviruses are hard to grow in culture. Uh, only recently were we able to grow noroviruses in culture. So this uh, interferes with, with antiviral development because you have to have a way of showing that your antiviral is effective, right? And uh, animal models are also needed. Not, there aren't animal models for every virus infection, yet the FDA has this rule, you need to show efficacy of an antiviral in two animal models. And for some viruses, that's impossible. There aren't, there aren't two for smallpox, for example. And then, of course, many of these viruses are dangerous. Ebola and Lassa, as you know, are dangerous. So it really limits the, the number of antivirals we have at, at several levels. But probably a very important reason, which makes antivirals different from antimicrobials, antibiotics, is that any antiviral has to completely block virus replication. Now, most of the pharmaceuticals that we take, not antivirals or antimicrobials, aren't 100% efficacious. 
You know, so for whatever it is that Tylenol does to you, it isn't 100% effective at doing that, but you don't need 100%. It's still good enough to be 75 or whatever percent effective. But viruses, the antivirals have to be 100% effective, otherwise you'll get a little bit of virus replication and you'll select for resistant mutants. You know, so Tylenol, if you have a little bit of a headache left, it doesn't really matter. You still feel better, to make the analogy. But it's not good for antivirals. You're going to get resistant mutants. So you have to have very, very strong inhibition. It has to be very potent. And it's really hard to do. So here's an example of this. Here is virus replication. Uh, this is in an animal of some kind. Uh, over time, and the drug is given. And you see there are three different doses of drug. And the red lines are viral replication or the amount of virus present. So if you can see, if you give a good amount, the optimal dose of the antiviral blocks replication. But if you give an intermediate dose, you get a little bit of replication. Uh, and then very quickly, resistant variants emerge. And you get a lot of replication, and even more so with a low dose. So in a person or an animal, if your drug isn't 100% effective at inhibiting virus replication, uh, you're going to get resistant mutants. It's simply not going to work. So partial activity isn't an option. Another reason why we have so many, so few antiviral drugs is that acute infections are difficult to diagnose and treat. Now, one of the problems is that they're short in duration, right? Influenza, uh, the infectious period is done very quickly. And often, by the time you're sick, by the time you feel sick, it's too late to treat with an antiviral. All right, so too sick. And also, we don't diagnose them, uh, which is in part because it's too hard to, uh, to treat people. But once we develop rapid diagnostics, we'll see many more drugs for acute infections, like noroviruses and rhinoviruses and influenza viruses. Now, one approach to this issue, so as you know, we've talked about acute virus infections. They're, they're big public health problems because they spread rapidly through populations. So we'd love to have ways to uh, inhibit them with antiviral drugs. One approach would be to give people uh, drugs prophylactically. So if there's an outbreak here at Columbia of, of a viral infection, right, you could give everybody an antiviral drug, and that should stop spread. But this is not a good idea. We generally don't like to give antivirals to healthy people. All right? and that's only going to help select for resistance, and if you have any side effects, it's going to amplify it. So having a broad antiviral might help but in certain outbreak situations, but in general, you just don't want to give everyone a, a, a broad spectrum antiviral. Now, speaking of broad spectrum antivirals, as you know, there are broad spectrum antibiotics. If you have an infection, a physician can start you on one of these before knowing what the actual bacterium is that's infecting you. We don't have any such things for viruses. A couple of years ago, this compound was developed, uh, LJ1001. This was developed by a virologist here at Mount Sinai. His name is Ben Hur Lee. I love his name. He's really a cool guy. And this is a antivirus that targets viruses with a lipid envelope, okay? And it inhibits their replication. So here's a list of different viruses, both enveloped and non-enveloped. So here is the virus uh, and whether it has an envelope or not. You can see all the viruses with a yes for an envelope. Uh, this antiviral inhibits its replication and they're from all diverse families. So this is almost a broad spectrum because it hits a lot of different viruses. It does not inhibit uh, adenoviruses, picornaviruses, or real viruses which don't have envelopes. The way this compound works is that it inserts into the lipid membrane of the virus and trashes it. It basically breaks it up. So here is the structure of this compound. And this, these are three electron micrographs of vesicular stomatitis virus particles uh, treated with this antiviral. So here is uh, virus particles treated with just the, uh, the solvent DMSO. Um, and this is another antiviral that has no activity. You can see the particles are intact. But here are particles treated with LJ001. The envelope is gone. All that's left is nucleocapsid. So this antiviral trashes the envelope. It breaks it, basically, and 
kills infectivity. And I talked with Ben Hur a little while ago about this. He doesn't think this will ever be licensed because they really don't understand uh, how it works and whether there would be any toxicity and so forth. But um, you can see that something like this would be needed to target all viruses uh, because uh, there's nothing in common other than this sort of thing. Yes? Yeah, so that's a good question. When you add this to cells, it doesn't, it doesn't have any cytotoxic effects, and we don't understand why, but one of the ideas is that the cell membrane in a cell is always turning over, right? So if you trash it, it gets regenerated very quickly, whereas in a virus, you got one to start with, and if you trash it, that's the end. You can't make a new one. But this kind of uncertainty is one of the reasons why this, this compound won't get uh, approved. But it's a proof of principle. So there are certain things that you can target. But the problem is, among all the viruses, there's, there's very little in common. Of course, there is in the cell, but you can't target that. So we started looking for antivirals in the early 50s. Uh, by then, we had made lots of antibacterials, you know, starting with the penicillins. And that was very, very successful. Uh, so chemists started taking derivatives of the antibacterials and seeing if they would inhibit viruses. Uh, so for example, the sulfonamide antibiotics for bacteria were modified and looked at for antiviral activity. Um, some of them were synthesized and were active against pox viruses, which by still after World War II were still a threat. Remember, they weren't eradicated until 1979, so people uh, still tried to develop antivirals for pox viruses. And just as an aside, just a few years ago, the U.S. commissioned several companies to develop new antivirals against smallpox for use in case of a bioterrorism threat. So these are all stockpiled now. Two different antivirals are stockpiled, you know, millions and millions of doses should there be an outbreak. This was a very controversial issue because there's no animal model for testing these antivirals. Um, they were tested against some other viruses that are related to smallpox, but we don't actually know if in an outbreak they will work against smallpox. So this was a really interesting story. In the 1960s and 70s, we switched to what we call blind screening assays. So here we take um, mixtures of compounds and just see if they inhibit uh, viral replication. So you just take a virus and you infect a cell and you add compounds to it and you see if you get inhibition. So these are random chemicals that a company might have. You know, companies, pharmaceutical companies have thousands of thousands of chemicals in their libraries that they save whenever a chemist makes something, they keep it. So those are called chemical libraries. You can also look at natural products. You go outside, you take some dirt, you culture it, and you take the, the supernatant and you could throw it on your cells and see if it uh, inhibits viruses. And that in fact works because there are lots of bacteria and fungi in the soil. Uh, that produce uh, a antiviral compounds. You then could identify hits, or, which are either compounds or mixtures that would inhibit replication. Then you have to purify the active ingredient. Uh, the chemists have to then synthesize it and then modify it to make it better. Um, you want to reduce, so whatever you start with is not going to be optimal. It might have a little toxicity, so the chemists try and take that away. You want it to be soluble. Uh, you want it to be bioavailable. If you have to take it orally, you want to make sure it gets to the right place where your virus infection is going to be. Uh, and you also want it to be stable. You don't want it to degrade in a few hours. And all these things are addressed by the chemists. They can look at a molecule and say, okay, we'll put these side groups here and it'll make it last longer. You go back in the lab, you see if it still has antiviral properties. Sometimes it loses it and you go back and say, no, nope, do it again. So there's this wonderful collaboration between the virologist and the, and the chemist. Um, these screens w went on for many years, and uh, a lot of work was done, but didn't really amount to much. Uh, one exception is this molecule here uh, called amantadine, uh, and this was approved in the 1960s to treat uh, influenza virus infections. In fact, we still use amantadine today in certain cases to treat influenza virus. So this was licensed for the treatment of flu, but we had no clue what the mechanism was. We didn't find that out uh, until later. Today, the uh, antiviral program is really different from this. You don't just take mixtures of chemicals and blindly look for inhibitors. You do a very focused approach. And this is in part uh, because we have recombinant DNA technology 
and really, really good chemistry to make different compounds. So for example, you could say, I want to make an antiviral that targets a viral protease. You can take the viral gene for the protease, you can produce it in cells, show that it's active, and then design assays to look for inhibitors. Um, and we can look at the inhibitors interacting with the proteases. We can do structural work, you know, three-dimensional x-ray crystallography and so forth, and that really informs uh, how we do this. We know a lot about the life cycles of viruses, as you've seen uh, in this course. So you can say we want to target very specific places. And even viruses that can't be grown readily, we can use approaches to uh, target them. If you can focus on a specific gene, you don't have to worry about growing a virus, at least in these initial uh, screens for antivirals. So it, the, what we do now is quite impressive in terms of antiviral discovery, and that's why the numbers are, are, are going up. If you look at the replication cycle of a virus in a cell, as you know, there are s different steps that viruses need to go through. They need to attach and enter cells. They need to be translated. They need to replicate their genomes and assemble. And each of these is a target for antiviral discovery. As I've told you, we have fusion and entry inhibitors. Uh, interferon uh, can interfere with the translation of some viruses, some viral mRNAs. Uh, the enzymes that replicate viral genomes, whether they be DNA or RNA or reverse transcriptases, can be inhibited with a variety of nucleoside or non-nucleoside analogs. We have a variety of protease inhibitors for HIV and HCV as well. And finally, neuraminidase uh, inhibitors. Neuraminidase functions in the release of virus from cells, and we'll look at that in a moment. How do you get to a, a drug? Well, you start with identifying a medical need, of course, is very important. If your infection, like I said last time for vaccines, if your virus only kills five people a year in the U.S., you will not have any company making a vaccine uh, or an antiviral. I mean, you can even go beyond that. It, it, it's unfortunate, but Ebola killed, you know, uh, hundreds of people in Africa for many years, and no one wanted to make a vaccine until we had this huge recent outbreak. So, you know, the, the driver is often uh, a monetary one, as you might understand. But once you have a medical need, uh, then you do some research and identify targets. Where in that replication cycle do you want to target an inhibitor? So let's say you find a gene that you want to inactivate with an antiviral. The first thing you have to do is, is prove that this gene is essential. You have to take it out of the virus if you can and show that the virus won't replicate. Because if it's not essential, then it would be a waste of time for you to design an antiviral against it. Uh, then once you've proven that, you can, do a little, you can do some structure studies on that protein to understand how it works. Uh, then you would start your screens. You could do natural product. You could make collections of, of chemistry products, RNAi even, uh, and do a variety of screens based on the, the uh, activity of the protein you're looking at. You can even do in silico screens. If you have the structure of the protein, you can ask what compounds can I model into it and have the chemists use that. Uh, from all this work, you would then make a lead compound, something that inhibits your protein or your activity. And then the chemists go to work on it. They modify it uh, to get various properties. You want it to get to the right place. As I've said, that's bioavailability. You want it to persist long enough. That's uh, the pharmacokinetics. And will it be safe? Uh, you, it, it, the toxicity has to be low. And you test that first in cells, and then you go into animals. A whole variety of animals you ask, is it toxic? And many drugs die at this stage because they're too toxic. At some point, you will have a lead compound that's been modified extensively to satisfy all of these properties here. Uh, and then you will move into animal models to see if it works to prevent infection. So far, you've just looked at cell culture. And now these are called the preclinical phases where you're in an animal model. This can take years as well. And if you have good results, then finally you can move into human studies, which can take many years. And these are divided into the phases of clinical trials, phases one, two, and three. This is all very expensive and time consuming. And uh, if you can start with 100,000 or so compounds, uh, you reject many of them because they don't have antiviral effects. You reject many. Uh, on early on for, for toxicity. 
Uh, you, have, you reject those which don't have antiviral effects in animals. You reject some for toxicity. If you're lucky to get into humans, uh, you probably wouldn't put anything into humans that ha had a bad profile in animals. But sometimes a drug, when placed in humans in a phase one, which is just for safety, few, few numbers of people, you will find toxicity as well, and you have to end the program. And look, you've already gone maybe 10 years, and you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. So this is another reason why antivirals are, are few in number. It's really costly, and whatever company is developing it needs to see down the line making enough money to recover these costs. Companies are in business to make profits. Most of them are, are, are public companies that are, their stock is traded and they have to uh, answer to their stockholders. Now in the, in the ideal world, wealthy governments would make antivirals and give them to everyone else. That I think would be the ideal situation, but that doesn't work. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of screens you might do to look for antiviral drugs. Here's an example of a mechanism-based screen. You're looking for a protease inhibitor. You have a viral protease you've identified that's essential for replication, and you want to find a drug that will block its activity. So here what we have done is to design a substrate for the protease. So these are amino acids, A, B, C, and D, and there's a cleavage site for your protease there. You attach these amino acids to a bead so you can separate them out rep rapidly. And then there is a, uh, a light bulb at the other end, some fluor fluorescent chemical or some kind of uh, readout that you can uh, image very quickly. So if you add the protease to this substrate, uh, it will cleave it, and you spin out uh, this part with the bead on it, and then you can measure the soluble portion, which will make light, and that's shown here in this uh, graph on the right. We're looking at fluorescence intensity of the soluble peptide versus time. So again, the soluble peptide's released. You spin down what's left uh, with the bead on it, and then you just take the supernatant and measure it. And you can very quickly measure the activity, and then you can test for different inhibitors. You add different chemicals to this reaction, and if your inhibitor is inhibiting the protease, you will be left with the bead attached to the uh, fluorescent inhibitor, uh, the fluorescent molecule. And when you centrifuge it, you'll remove all the activity and you'll see nothing in the supernatant because no cleavage is occurring. So this is the kind of assay you can develop and you can make a high throughput version of it where you, you test thousands and thousands of compounds in a day because it can be automated uh, and the results are very straightforward much easier than starting with a virus, infecting a cell, and looking for protease inhibitors because you, you wouldn't be able to target a specific part of the replication cycle. So here's an example. That was a in vitro screen where we just have purified material. Here's an example of a cell-based screen where you can use bacteria to look for antivirals. So in this case, what we have here is a tetracycline uh, efflux protein. This is a protein in the membrane of tetracycline resistant bacteria. Tetracycline, as you know, is an antibiotic. It inhibits bacteria. If the bacteria carry this efflux protein, it pumps out the tetracycline as soon as it gets in, so the it makes the bacteria resistant to the antibiotic. What's been done here is to engineer an HIV protease cleavage site in one of these loops in this efflux protein. You can see it's a multiple transmembrane protein. And someone years ago found that these loops are essential for activity. So you can put an HIV protease site in here. And then it will be cleaved. When you produce the HIV protease in these bacteria, it will cleave this protein and it will make the cells sensitive to set tetracycline. So for example, if we have um, the, the HIV protease produced in these cells, it will cleave the efflux protein. And if you plate the bacteria on agar with tetracycline, you won't get any colonies. So this is a really nice readout. Do you get colonies or not? Uh, if you have now added an inhibitor of the protease, it prevents cleavage of this loop, and now you will get colonies, bacteria growing in the presence of tetracycline. So again, a very rapid way to screen many, many compounds to see if you can inhibit this protease activity. There are many more like this that have been designed uh, of course, many of them are proprietary and we don't know about because the companies won't tell us, but people can be very clever with this. How about the compounds themselves? Um, you can 
uh, you can screen many compounds with these approaches. Uh, as I said, com companies have chemical libraries. Every compound they've ever made for whatever use over the years, you can screen uh, in these and you can screen many compounds a day. You can still look at natural products. You have to go outside and collect things and grow them and make broths from them. You can do combinatorial chemistry. There's some very clever chemistry that's been developed where you can design uh, thousands and thousands of different molecules uh, which you can then use in your screen. And here's one example where you use uh, different linkers and attach to them uh, different fragments. So uh, here are the linkers here and then you attach different fragments which are chemical side groups uh, of various sorts and you can make a whole matrix of this very quickly and you can then test those for binding to your antiviral in your assay. You can also do structure based design. You can use the three dimensional structure of a protein determined by x-ray crystallography to tell you what the chemical should look like. So if you're lucky and you have the ligand, the natural ligand inserted into the protein, you can try and mimic that chemically. You can also do what's called in silico screening. You let a computer take the active site of a protein and design molecules that will fit in and then the chemists can follow up and actually make them and see if they work. And this has actually uh, turned out to be fruitful in a number of cases. The screening we do today is all roboticized. You have screening done in plastic plates with many, many wells in them. You've probably heard of 96 well plates. Well, this plate has over 1,000. And because you can do these assays individually in these plates and put a different compound in every well, for example, everything is added uh, to the plates by a robot. There's no, no person standing there with a pipette man and putting 1,000. It would take you years, right? So this robot, you program it, and it just zips down and puts everything into the wells. Uh, then another robot shown here picks up each plate, shoves it in an incubator. When the time's up, it takes it out and puts it in a reader. And you could be sitting home on Sunday morning and uh, getting your results for your latest antiviral screen. It's really quite impressive what's done now. All right, uh, the first question is, we have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What is a reason for the difference? One, robotic screening is slow. Two, there are few serious viral infections. Three, resistance is a problem. Four, antivirals must be potent. Five, all of the above. All right, 68% of you answered D, antivirals must be potent. Of all these, that's the main reason. Um, there aren't few serious viral infections. They're, they're a good number we'd like to be able to treat. Resistance is a problem, but it's not, it doesn't prevent you from getting antivirals. It prevents them from working afterwards, as you will see. So let's talk about resistance to antiviral drugs. This is a common problem. Any antiviral you make, at some point, you're going to get resistance to it. And that's because not only viruses replicate very well, they make lots of progeny, but their mutation rates are very high. And if you're treating chronic infections, and in fact, most of our antivirals are against chronic viral infections, you're going to treat people for many years, and eventually, you're going to get resistance. So we have about 100 antiviral drugs. We've got resistance to every one of them already. Every one of those are, have resistant mutants. And that's a problem is because we don't have that many. So with antibacterials, you know, you can treat someone and you get resistance, you switch to another and so forth. But with antivirals, often we don't have a lot of options. So you have some cases where you have one antiviral that's useful if you get resistance you can't stop the infection and your patient's going to die. Now, the good side is that we can study this resistance and get some information about uh, how the antiviral works and maybe tell us how to make new uh, antivirals as well. You know, one, one approach, for example, is to design an antiviral so that if resistance does emerge, the fitness cost will be so high that the virus can't spread. So some of the newer hepatitis C virus antivirals, you can get resistance in the laboratory, but then the virus grows really poorly, and so it's not likely that those are going to spread in people. So if you can somehow do that, uh, then that will really help you, and sometimes studying existing resistance allows you to do so. So why do we get resistance to drugs? It all has to do with the errors that are made by nucleic acid polymerases. All the ones we've talked about in this course, the DNA polymerases, the RNA polymerases, the reverse transcriptases, are polymerases, they all make mistakes. 
right? Uh, and they typically make, uh, well, for RNA, all, all virus polymerases make the same error rate, but the difference is that RNA viruses and reverse transcriptase can't fix the errors. So the error rates for RNA viruses is one misincorporation in 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides polymerized. And that's about a million fold higher than the polymerase of our genome. So again, all nucleic acid polymerases are error prone, but DNA polymerase have uh, error correction mechanisms, so their error rate is lower. It's, it's not to say that it's absent, right? We still make m mutations, uh, and that's responsible for, example, cancer. If our cells keep dividing, they'll eventually accumulate enough mutations to become cancerous. So we're not absent of mutation. In fact, you don't want to be absent because mutation is how we evolve. So in a 10 kilobase viral genome, uh, you get a mutation in one to 10 genomes at this frequency. So DNA virus polymerases or all DNA polymerase can, can excise uh, and correct misincorporation. So here we have a DNA polymerase copying a template. It makes a mistake shown in red, the mismatch. There's a three to five prime exonuclease associated with these polymerases that can come in and clip out the error and the polymerase will do it again. So that's why the error rate is lower. But uh, the result is that DNA viruses evolve more slowly because they can't make uh, as many mistakes. All right, let's talk about some uh, specific antivirals. First one we're going to talk about in terms of resistance anyway is called acyclovir. This is a drug against herpes simplex virus. If you have a cold sore and you go to the doc, he or she will prescribe you topical acyclovir, an ointment which you will put on your cold sore, and it's pretty good at getting rid of the virus. Here's a cyclovir. This and many other antivirals that target uh, DNA polymerases or RNA polymerase are derivatives of the nucleosides. The, nu the four nucleosides are shown in the middle here at adenosine, guanosine, uh, cytidine, and thymidine. And remember, these are the building blocks of DNA. They get incorporated into DNA, and then another uh, nucleoside gets added to this three prime hydroxyl. These drugs are all derivatives of these nucleosides. So we have a cyclovir, which you can see uh, the, uh, the ring, the ribose ring is broken, and so this cannot act as an acceptor for the next base. It's a chain terminator. It's the same with many of these. The deoxycytidine uh, is another one. It's missing the hydroxyl. And all of these are derivatives of the various uh, nucleosides. So a cyclovir uh, is one that's very, very potent against herpes viruses. The way uh, that this works is when you treat a person with a cyclovir, that's shown on the left here, this gets into cells rapidly. If you have phosphates on these molecules, they will not get into cells. Phosphates don't transfer across the membrane very readily. So this acyclovir will get into cells and then if the cell is infected by a herpes virus, the herpes virus makes a protein kinase, or a kinase called thymidine kinase, and it will phosphorylate a cyclovir. So this happens inside the cell. If this gets into an uninfected cell, it won't get phosphorylated and nothing will happen. So this drug has very low toxicity as a consequence. Then the cellular kinases take over, they put another two phosphates on. So now this can be a substrate for DNA synthesis. So the viral DNA polymerase will incorporate uh, acyclovir triphosphate into the growing DNA chain and then synthesis will stop because you cannot add the next uh, base on because there's no hydroxyl, it's been removed. Here's guanosine from which ACV is derived. You see there's no hydroxyl there. So these are chain terminators. They inhibit the viral DNA polymerase. Again, they're specific for virus-infected cells because the viral thymidine kinase phosphorylates the prodrug, the acyclovir, so that it can be incorporated. If this weren't phosphorylated, it would not be inhibitory. This has been improved. This is just a, an interesting example of how you can improve a drug. Acyclovir was not very bioavailable. So if you want to treat people by having them take it orally, uh, it didn't go to the right place. You, you can treat uh, various disseminated herpes simplex infections that way, not just fever sores. But it wasn't uh, very bioavailable. But it turned out that putting an amino acid valine right here onto the acyclovir 
made a drug uh, called valacyclovir. Uh, and um, this is much more bioavailable. It's taken up after all administration. And then the amino acid is cleaved off by host cell enzymes. So valine makes it go to the right place in your body after taking it orally. And then the valine's removed so it can be an inhibitor. Because with the valine on, of course, it couldn't be phosphorylated and it wouldn't be active. But this is an amazing example of how the chemists try different things. This worked and it also was uh, active against the virus. We do get very easily uh, acyclovir resistant herpes simplex viruses. Uh, there are two kinds of mutants. Some of them can't phosphorylate the prodrug. Uh, these are mutations in the viral TK gene. So you can select for amino acid changes that will not recognize uh, acyclovir and it won't phosphorylate it. Or you can get mutations in the viral DNA polymerase. Uh, in this case, the drug will be phosphorylated by TK, but the polymerase will not recognize it, so it's not inhibitory. All right, so two different kinds of um, resistance. Now, AIDS patients in particular have a big problem here because remember, we all have all these herpes viruses in us, herpes simplex, EBV, CMV, et cetera, and we're all healthy because we have great immune systems. But if you get immunosuppressed, as you do when you get HIV infection, all of these herpes viruses replicate extensively and they can cause very serious disease. So these individuals are often treated with acyclovir or valcyclovir, but they, uh, they generate resistance very quickly because these viruses are replicating extensively. Uh, you often get cross resistance. There are many other nucleoside analogs that we can use for herpes viruses, but often resistance to one will cause resistance to another. There's one last resort, a, a DNA polymerase inhibitor called Foscarnet, uh, which could be used, but sometimes uh, resistance to that emerges as well. And then these infections can be life-threatening. So uh, emantidine is that antiviral developed in the 60s against influenza virus. It's shown up here in the upper right. Uh, in the 90s, we figured out how that works. It actually interacts with the M2 protein, which is an ion channel, and this blocks entry of protons into the virus particle. So here's influenza virus entering the cell. We saw this a long time ago. The virus binds receptors. It's taken up by endocytosis. As the endosome moves into the cell, uh, protons are pumped into the endosome by the cell to acidify the endosome. And then those protons enter the virus particle through the M2 ion channel, which is in the virus particle. And that, proton, th that acidification of the virus particle interior is important for releasing the viral RNA so it can get into the nucleus. So that's what's blocked by amantadine, the ability of the protons to get into the virus interior. So here is a model of uh, the M2 ion channel in the viral membrane. Okay, so this is the virus membrane on either side. Here is the uh, M2 ion channel. It's a tetramer, a relatively short protein. But this forms a channel, and protons flow through it into the virus interior, from the endosome lumen into the interior of the virus. And this is important for uncoding. Without this, uncoding doesn't occur. Uh, amantadine is shown here in red. It binds inside the channel to block the flow of protons into the virus interior. It also binds outside of the channel and inhibits by an allosteric mechanism uh, the protons from th flowing through. The end result is when the virus membrane fuses with the endosome, the viral RNAs stay on the inside of the virus particle and the infection is stopped. So that's why this is an antiviral. Parenthetically, the reason we understand the whole entry pathway is because of this compound because we understood that acidification of the virus is important for infection. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Acyclovir, amantadine, LJ001, penicillin, or all of the above? 63% of you answered acyclovir, which is a, an inhibitor of the herpes virus DNA polymerase. So of course that's the enzyme. Mantadine is an inhibitor of the ion channel of flu, which is not an enzyme. LJ001 is the membrane trashing drug. I'm glad none of you picked penicillin, but those of you who picked all of the above, penicillin is a antibacterial, of course. Let's talk about the inhibitors of the influenza neuraminidase. These maybe some of you have actually taken. 
Uh, the neuraminidase is one of the two glycoproteins on the surface of the virus. We have the hemagglutinin and HA in the neuraminidase. Neuraminidase uh, functions late in infection. So after new virus particles are budded from the plasma membrane, these virus particles would simply reattach to cellular receptors if it weren't for the neuraminidase. The neuraminidase acts there. It cleaves off the sialic acid from the cell surface so that the newly made viruses can float away. Okay? Otherwise, if you inhibit the neuraminidase, which you can do with a drug, all the viruses remain stuck on the cell surface. So that is a, is a finding made many years ago that neuraminidase inhibition would do that, and recently it led to the development of two drugs that target this neuraminidase. So here's the neuraminidase protein. It is a tetramer on the surface of the particle, and its substrate is sialic acid. Sialic acid is the receptor for the virus, remember, and neuraminidase has to remove it from the surface of the cell so that the new virus particles can float away. So the, the substrate for, for neuraminidase is sialic acid, and you can see it in the pocket uh, of the neuraminidase there. That's the active site of the enzyme. Remember, this is an enzyme that is going to cleave sialic acid from the surface of the cell so that the new viruses can, can go away. So we knew how sialic acid fit into the neuraminidase. We, we determined the structure by x-ray crystallography. So the chemist said, let's design a molecule that looks like sialic acid and fits in there with high affinity that would block the natural sialic acid from getting in. So these two compounds were designed, zanamivir and oseltamivir. This one is called Tamiflu, so you have to have a friendly name, right? And this is called Relenza. But these are designed to mimic sialic acid. And the idea was, if you can make a compound that's very close to sialic acid, then maybe the neuraminidase can undergo a mutation that would prevent the drug from working, because then it wouldn't bind sialic acid, and the virus wouldn't be infectious, right? But you can see these two are slightly different. And actually, one of them is better at mimicking sialic acid than the other. So here's how uh, this works. Here's the virus particle. This has just been released from a cell. And here is sialic acid uh, on the host cell surface. The neuraminidase is engaging it. It's going to cleave sialic acid off so that the HA cannot bind to it anymore. And the virus particle can go free. All right. Uh, Zanamivir is a great mimic of sialic acid. So the sialic acid binding site we're representing as a V here. And zanamivir fits right into that V really nice, and we get very little mutation uh, as a consequence to zanamivir. On the other hand, oseltamivir, eh, it's not quite a perfect mimic of sialic acid, so it fits in a little differently. So you can get mutations, amino acid changes uh, in the neuraminidase active site, and three of them are shown here, and they will cause the Tamiflu to be bumped out to not bind well, yet this neuraminidase will still bind sialic acid. Okay, so it's a really interesting example of how the closer you get to the natural ligand with your inhibitor, the better off you will be in terms of resistance. Now, every year the CDC keeps track of all the samples that are sent to them from people with suspected influenza. They isolate viruses from many of them, and they test the drug resistance of many of those isolates. And you can find that here at this website of the CDC. So this is, uh, these are results on neuraminidase inhibitor resistance testing uh, since October of last year, about when the flu season began. So again, you take these viruses, you put them in cells and culture, and you add Tamiflu or, or Relenza, and you see if the virus is replicated or not. So we have uh, three different kinds of flu circulating. We have the H1N1, and they have tested 44 samples and only one was resistant to Tamiflu. None uh, were resistant to Zanamivir. Uh, Paramivir is a intravenously administered version of Oseltamivir for very sick people, one resistant. Influenza H3N2, uh, no resistance to uh, either. Uh, lots of samples collected this year. You see the, the dominant strain this year was H3N2. And you can see 2,600 samples. No resistance. Very good. 
and the influenza B strains are also no resistance showing. So this year it's pretty good. Uh, so if you get very sick and you need to take these, you don't have to worry about resistance. On the other hand, uh, most of these viruses are resistant to uh, amantadine, that inhibitor of the M2 ion channel. So we don't even bother with those. Uh, one of the reasons why we have widespread resistance to amantadines is that pig farmers often put this drug in pig feed so they don't get influenza, but that just selects for uh, antiviral resistance. Now, a long time ago, we talked about how the coronaviruses enter cells, and I told you about a compound that helped us understand that process. And these are inhibitors of picornavirus uncoding. And I want to just show you this to give you again a sense for how chemistry is used in the antiviral drug development process. So here are a series of compounds starting with this compound on the upper left. So this was a screen for inhibitors of poliovirus. And they picked up this compound in their chemical library, just screening the library of a company. And then they made a variety of modifications to this. You can see different side groups, uh, changes to the ring, and so forth. These are all different compound derivatives of this. And then they test them for their inhibitory properties. Uh, and then you can see they have different, so he, here they've made uh, a change. Uh, I can't even see where it is. But anyway, it knocked out the activity uh, of the compound. And some of them make it better. On the right here is, a, is an example of how they vary the length of uh, this ring from the rest of the molecule and look at the MIC. And you can see at a certain length it's more active than others. So this is the kind of chemistry that's done to take an initial compound to make it more potent and of course eventually to give it other properties that are important as well. And just to remind you, these compounds fit into the hydrophobic pocket in the, in the capsid, which is just below the receptor binding site. They fit in there and they lock the capsid in a configuration that will not uncoat. So that's how uh, those compounds were, were discovered. Of course, unfortunately, many of those, none of those have ever had any clinical use. Uh, they simply aren't effective enough at preventing infections. But a greater problem is that uh, these have been tested for use against the common cold and that's such a rapidly developing infection that these are not very useful. By the way, I meant to tell you that these two antivirals for influenza, uh, Tamiflu uh, and Relenza, you have to take those within 24 to 48 hours of feeling your first symptoms. Because if you wait any longer, they will absolutely have no effect whatsoever. So you know, you can tell when you first get flu, you can pinpoint the hour almost. So you have to quickly go to your physician and get prescribed if, in fact, this is what you want. Otherwise, they won't be of any use. A couple of new hepatitis C virus drugs have just been licensed last year. Uh, this, of course, is a big medical problem. I told you earlier about how many millions of people are infected uh, with hepatitis C. Here's a, a schematic of the viral RNA genome. It's a plus-stranded RNA. It's translated into a polyprotein, just like the Bacornas, and viral proteases cleave up that polyprotein. A major viral protease is NS3, which is responsible for all of these processing show, sites shown by the, the arrows there. So NS3 has been a target for antiviral drug development for quite some time now. And we have two brand new inhibitors on the market, Boseprevir and Telaprevir, both licensed and being used globally uh, to treat hep C infections. Uh, and this is the structure of the NS3 protease is the active site with the ARG, uh, HIS, and lysine active site residues. And this is the structure of telaprevir bound in the pocket. So you can see it binds in the pocket of the protease. It prevents the substrate, which would be the polyprotein, from getting in there. And it really nicely inhibits uh, virus replication. The um, other antiviral that's just being tested, it's not licensed yet, is a nucleic acid molecule. I told you a while ago that uh, replication of the hep C genome requires a cellular microRNA called MIR-122. And MIR-122 binds to the 5' non-coding region uh, of the viral RNA. So here the viral RNA is shown with stem loop structures in the 5' UTR. MIR-122 is required to bind there in order for efficient virus replication. This is a liver-specific microRNA. And this, in part, explains why the virus is hepatotropic. If you block this MIR-122 with another nucleic acid, 
that's shown here, you can block virus replication. So these nucleic acids that are made complementary to MIR-122, these are called locked nucleic acids. They're chemically modified so that they have a long half-life in the blood. They're not degraded quickly. And they hybridize with the MIR-122, and they block it from being able to hybridize to the viral genome. And this has now been through a phase two human trial. So in other words, phase one is safety, just to make sure there are no bad side effects. Phase two, additional safety, but you want to know if the drug is efficacious, if it will prevent infection. So you take people who are already infected with hep C, and you treat them with this drug, and you see if it reduces their viral load. And that's what's shown here. Uh, these are individuals who got five weekly injections of either a placebo or uh, the drug, which is called Miravirsin. And we're measuring virus loads, viral RNA. And you can see those that got the placebo, uh, no effect on viral loads. Those that got this drug showed a marked several log reduction uh, in virus loads. This is quite interesting. This is a persistent effect just from giving them injections of this RNA. So if this makes it through the phase three, this will probably be licensed uh, as another anti-hep C antiviral. Many companies are developing antivirals for hep C. This is a very, very big market. And this is a, just a partial lift, list of the new drug pipeline. You can find this at hcvdrugs.com. Uh, these are just some of the compounds in phase two in combinations. Okay, combinations of different inhibitors. You can see uh, these different drugs here, uh, and these are the companies that are doing this. And you can see here also when these have been started. So this is a key point that using a drug in combination is very important because this minimizes uh, resistance. So let's talk a little bit about HIV antivirals. We haven't yet talked about HIV at all or very little in this course, but this is a retrovirus. Uh, that infects cells, produces a DNA copy of its RNA genome. The DNA integrates into the cell, uh, and then that, that integrated provirus makes, uh, directs the synthesis of mRNAs uh, by the cell polymerase, which give rise to new virus particles that, that form by budding. There are many good inhibitory targets for HIV, and in fact, we do have inhibitors of uh, attachment and fusion. We have lots of reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We have integrase inhibitors. That's the enzyme that puts the provirus into the cell genome. Um, and we also have protease inhibitors, which are, of course, important. These proteases are important for cleaving the viral polyprotein. Big problem with AIDS, of course, is that this disease can go on for 10 or 20 years. The virus is replicating. You're giving these individuals drugs. It's very easy to get viral resistance. The first drug licensed for treatment of age was this called azetodeoxythymidine, or AZT. This had been found for other uh, medicinal purposes, but it is a chain terminator. It is phosphorylated by cellular kinases, so you take the drug AZT is right here, and you can see there, there is an azeto group here, so you cannot add additional nucleosides to this when it's incorporated into the DNA. Uh, this is phosphorylated by cellular kinases, 1, 2, 3 phosphates, and then it's incorporated uh, by the viral reverse transcriptase. When it gets made, when it gets incorporated into a growing DNA, then chain elongation stops because you cannot add more bases onto that azido group. So this is an inhibitor of reverse transcriptase, which makes a DNA copy of the RNA. This will be recognized by cellular polymerases, DNA polymerases. So there is some toxicity uh, associated with its use. It's not as selective as acyclovir because this is phosphorylated by a cellular kinase, which means it will also get into an uninfected cell. This drug has side effects because of that. Um, Half-life is very short, an hour, but it was the only thing we had back then, and we had to dose patients frequently. And as a consequence of these features, mutations to resistance arose uh, very quickly. There's a great movie about the early days of AZT, the Dallas Buyers Club, right? Have you heard of that? Fantastic. You should watch it because they talk all about AZT and they, the, the fact that the patients couldn't get it because the NIH was hoarding it and 
patients figured out if you split the dose into five, you could spread it among others and it still worked and that reduced the side effects. Really cool. Uh, you'll recognize a lot of this stuff. So anyway, we got mutations to uh, resistance very early. Single amino acid changes uh, in the reverse transcriptase so that it, it will not bind the phosphorylated AZT. As a consequence, new inhibitors were developed, new nucleoside analogs with all these fancy names. Um, so they started to, when these were used singly, we got resistance very quickly, so they were started to be used in pairs. And that helped, but still, in about a year, resistance to two drugs arose as well. So then next uh, were developed the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or NNRTIs. So remember, the nucleoside inhibitors get incorporated by the reverse transcriptase into the growing chain, and then the chain terminate because you can't add any more nucleosides. These work in a different way. These are drugs that bind close to but not within the active site. So here's a model of the reverse transcriptase of HIV. And here's the palm domain. Remember, this, has, this enzyme has fingers and palm and thumb domains. The palm is the active site. And there's the active site right there. Here's where some of these NNRTIs bind. It's the green space-filling molecule right there. So they bind near the active site. They deform it, and they prevent addition of new triphosphate. So they're not chain terminators, but they do inhibit uh, enzyme uh, activity. And here are just three of these NNRTIs, nevirapine, delaverdine, and efavirenz. Uh, if you think these names are tough, this is actually the chemical name for nevirapine, and the, uh, the generic name for this is viromune. Of course, these were used singly initially. They're a brand new class of drugs, very exciting. Very rapidly, we got resistance, resistance to these drugs, amino acid substitutions, uh, in the binding site and the enzyme for these compounds, so the compounds simply will not bind. Uh, and so these are again used today in combination therapy. You cannot use any of these by themselves anymore because you will simply uh, get resistance uh, and it's a waste of time. We have protease inhibitors for HIV. Now, of course, this, this virus presents a huge medical need. Today, there have been 60 million infections globally. There are currently 34 million people living with AIDS, so huge medical need. Many, many companies have been developing uh, antivirals. To bring you back to the maturation of retroviruses, uh, these viruses produce a polyprotein, which includes structural components like matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, and the capsid protein, uh, and these get cleaved uh, by the viral protease, which is the yellow molecule right here. And in fact, the protease then is essential for cleavage of these proteins. And then when you have a new virus particle formed by budding, the protease is incorporated into the virus particle. That's the yellow spheres that you can see there. And then once the virus has budded from the cell, the protease carries out a series of additional cleavages that are essential for infectivity. So this protease is essential. It was shown early on if you mutate it or delete it, the virus is not infectious. So many companies went on to develop protease inhibitors. And the way this was done was as follows. Uh, the sequence of the polyprotein was determined and the cleavage site was identified. So here, for example, is one of uh, the natural substrates of the protease. Uh, here's the cleavage site and here are the amino acids on either side. So what was done was to develop what are called peptidomimetics. These are short molecules that essentially mimic what the enzyme is seeing in this protein. And these peptidomimetics fit into the protease and they block its activity. And here on the upper right is a three-dimensional structure of the HIV protease with one of these antivirals bound to it. So it binds with very high affinity into the active site. So now the protease can no longer cleave the viral protein substrate, which it needs to do, and infectivity is inhibited. So there are quite a few of those uh, protease inhibitors available now. A very recent addition, 2007, is, was the first integrase inhibitor. There are now a couple of these. Remember, integrase is the viral enzyme that's needed to put the viral DNA into our cellular genome, an obligate part of the replicative cycle. If you take out integrase, the virus cannot replicate. And the way integrase works 
Uh, its integrase is shown as this sphere with two active sites in it. Uh, it recognized the host DNA, these two purple lines, and then the viral DNA shown in blue comes in. The integrase makes a nick in both strands, and those DNA strands are ligated to the host DNA. These integrase inhibitors, one of which is shown at the upper right, raltegravir, which is produced by Merck, these bind to the integrase molecule. In fact, they're shown here as this gray box, and they prevent the viral DNA from being uh, added to the host DNA. And the way they work is very cool. So the integrase has a series of acidic residues that chelate uh, metal ions, okay? And that chelation is important for the activity of this enzyme. This is actually reminiscent of the metal ions that bind in the active site of DNA and RNA polymerases. They're needed to bring the next triphosphate into the active site. So in the same way, integrase has these metal binding residues that are needed to bring in uh, triphosphates to help it complete the integration reaction. These drugs bind to the metal ions in the active site. So you can see one of them here called DKA. It's, it's uh, interacting with the two metal ions, so that prevents the triphosphates from coming in, so the enzyme activity is inhibited. Very, very, very clever inhibitor. We also have for HIV a binding inhibitor. Now you may remember that the receptor for uh, HIV is CD4, but it also requires a second molecule on the cell surface, a chemokine receptor, and that's diagrammed on the right here. So the viral glycoprotein called GP120 uh, interacts first with CD4 and then with uh, CCR5 or CXCR4. So here we're showing CCR5. You need to get a high affinity binding between GP120 and CCR5 to get virus infection. If you take away CCR5 from cells, the virus will not replicate. So this is a great target for intervention. A drug was discovered called Maraviroc, which binds to CCR5. Here's the drug on the left. It binds to the protein CCR5, and when and that binding actually changes the overall conformation of CCR5, so it uh, disrupts the interaction with virus and doesn't allow for high affinity interaction and consequently uh, blocks binding. So this is a very interesting uh, binding inhibitor that's targeting the second protein needed uh, for infection. And that as actually doesn't have a lot of toxicity because as you may remember, uh, a number of people have deletions in the CCR5 gene that don't even make the protein. So apparently you can live without this. So an inhibitor that targets it has no toxicity. Uh, the last HIV inhibitor I want to tell you about is a fusion inhibitor. So remember way back when we have uh, HIV glycoprotein uh, binding to the cellular receptor. It gets taken up into the cell uh, and then uh, the fusion protein of the glycoprotein is exposed and inserts into the cell membrane. So this was a common motif for a variety of viruses that fuse their membranes. They, they bind a receptor and then they put a fusion protein up into the cell membrane. And then for fusion to occur, this um, structure has to form a hairpin. And it's shown in the next section here. Basically, uh, the, the, two, um, the molecule bends and it draws the two membranes together and that's the conformation shown here. And then eventually the, um, the two membranes get so close that they fuse and then the virus nucleic acid gets in. So we talked a little bit about this hairpinning molecule in terms of flu, but it also happens with HIV as well. This inhibitor is actually a 36 amino acid peptide, which is made chemically. And the peptide uh, anneals to these uh, N-terminal regions of the glycoprotein and prevent them from undergoing this hairpin reaction. So here are the inhibitors shown bound to this, uh, this trimer of, of the N-terminal region. And because they're bound to it, the hairpinning can't occur. So the binding of the peptide basically prevents the hairpinning, it prevents fusion, it prevents the uh, virus from getting into cells. This is a very expensive drug, it costs about $25,000 a year to take. Uh, you get it as a powder, you have to mix it yourself, 
and inject it yourself. Um, but, and of course, just like all the others, if you use it just on its own, you get resistance. And the resistance is caused by amino acid changes in the GP120, right in that N-terminal region, that prevent uh, these peptides from binding. So that makes a lot of sense. Which of the following targets for HIV antiviral therapy inhibits the earliest stage of infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, NNRTIs, CCR5, integrase, fusion. There you go, 56% of you said CCR5. That's inhibiting binding, right? It's the very first step virus cell interaction. Fusion is later than that, and everything else, of course, is later as well. Now, what makes AIDS a treatable disease is combination therapy, also known as highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART. And it's basically a combination of three different drugs with different targets, and this works. You, you get very low resistance unless you stop taking them for a while, uh, and you can have people living the entire lives. We haven't gone long enough to know how long, but uh, this really works very well, and this was a revolution. So let's look at the numbers to understand why this works. So let's say you just need one mutation to be resistant to a drug. The virus makes a mutation every 10,000 bases polymerized. That means every base is substituted in a collection of 10,000 viruses, you'll have every base substituted, okay? Everybody makes about 10 to the 10th new viruses per day. So if you have AIDS, early onset AIDS, making 10 to the 10th per day. So 10 to the 10th divided by 10,000, which is you know, the whole collection of mutants, a million viruses are going to be produced each day with resistance to one drug. So if you have AIDS and you go to get a drug, a single drug in you is going to be a lot of viruses that are already resistant, and that's why you get resistance to one drug very quickly. So let's take two drugs. Developing resistance to two uh, is, is 10 to the fourth times 10 to the fourth or 10 to the eighth. So we have 10 to the tenth viruses in us divided by 10 to the eighth. We're going to get 100 viruses resistant to two drugs every day. And again, so if you have uh, AIDS and you go for a drug, right away you're going to have, and you only get two, you're going to have 100 viruses resistant to that combination of two. And that's why eventually, even with dual therapy, you, you emerge, uh, you get uh, resistant mutants. But three drugs, uh, you need 10 to the 12 viruses. And that is uh, more than you're making every day by two orders of magnitude. So that's why triple therapy works. If you go in, even with full-blown AIDS, making a lot of viruses a day, the three drugs are going to inhibit all of them. There aren't going to be any resistant mutants to start. So uh, this is why triple therapy works and why it can convert this infection into a lifelong uh, chronic infection. So this is a table of some of the antivirals. It's not all of them by any means that have been developed uh, against HIV-1. And again, the reason we have this is because it's a huge medical need. The other reason is because many of these were fast-tracked. If you watch the Dallas Buyers Club, you will, you will learn about this uh, early on it was felt that pharmaceutical companies were not taking the disease seriously enough, and this was absolutely true. And the FDA said, well, we can make it so that you get licensed quicker. So normally it takes years to license a drug. Once you apply for licensure and you give the FDA all your data, it can take a long time. But here, the time to approval is all pretty much less than a year for all of these drugs. So this is a reflection of the fast tracking that the FDA did, and it really brought a lot of these drugs to market very, very quickly. So again, here on this table, we have our uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, our non-nucleoside inhibitors. You can see there are lots of those. Protease inhibitors, quite a few. One fusion inhibitor, um, one CCR5 entry inhibitor. There are now three integrase inhibitors. And then at the bottom are, are multi-class combinations. These are the triple uh, drug pills. The first one to be licensed was a tripla but now there are several others as well. So this is just a reflection of what can be done when there is pressure uh, to make an antiviral. You could diagnose AIDS very rapidly, and the infection went on long enough so that it made sense to develop an antiviral. 
and we had been studying retroviruses of different sorts for years. So we knew there was reverse transcriptase, we knew there was a protease in them, we knew uh, how these viruses attached, we knew already what the targets were for antiviral intervention. So those are all the reasons why uh, this proceeded so quickly. I told you this in the first lecture. At the moment, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on the planet. You can take 10 to the 10th per person and multiply that times the number of people infected. With that high number, there's resistance to all of these drugs I've just showed you out there and anything we could ever make. And that's why it's really important for us to, to treat these infections with triple therapy and not single products because we'll get resistance immediately if we do.